Hi everybody and welcome to AQ's Blog and Grill. We're really excited today to have Norm Clare with us. Now Norm is the VP of Technology Strategy um, and he's, I've known Norm for a long time and he's the guy that makes technology actually work for him effectively and he then shares that with his, uh, with, with his clients. A great synthesizer of uh, what technology could do, what it should do and what it actually does. So welcome Norm. Thanks Alan, great to be here. Well, Excellent. Now, how long have we known each other? Well, I joined Corey uh, just over 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Isn't yeah. that something? And neither one of us have aged a day. Well, you certainly haven't, Alan. Oh, Norm, you see, and that's why we get along so well. <laughs> so what's happening, what, what's happening in, the, in the digital branding technology landscape these days? Norm, what's kind of got you interested? What are you excited about? Well, it's an incredibly fast-paced area, and I think... Uh, while technology has fundamentally changed how people buy, I mm -hmm. think it's afforded opportunities to really be creative in how they approach um, uh, the buying journey and selling and connecting with customers as well. Right. So th this buying journey now, um, is, this, is this something that we as marketers or people in branding have a better sense of how people are going to behave? I think so. I think uh, you know there's been a large focus on primary customer insight to give us you know good signals about what those buying journeys can be, mm -hmm. and uh, you know a lot of those buying journeys are in person. A lot of it takes place online, and it's um, it's interesting the mix of the online and in person buying journey to really understand that and understand how you know the digital transformation plays into that. Ah, digital transformation. So give us an example, Norm, if you will, um, about. How the how the web is is actually transforming these days? What how is it how is it changing mm. in you know a dramatic way? Wow, uh, you know one of the things I've been thinking a lot about lately is uh, a topic uh, we've been paying a lot of attention to, which is um, kind of the advent of uh, what we're calling branded top level domains. Uh, in 2012, ICANN, the uh, organization that sort of uh, creates and is in charge of these domain names uh, allowed applicants to uh, af apply for branded uh, top-level domains. So right. this would be like a Nike could apply for uh, .nike. So a top-level domain we're familiar with would be something like .com uh -huh. or .org. Right. Uh, now organizations can apply for their brand name dot, dot .nike. Right. And, and, and why, would, why would large organizations uh, invest their time and of course money in getting these these domain names so specific to their company or to their brand, yeah, what's that's in it for them? A really great question. I think initially it was just protection. Um, you know, it's a trademark, and so much like they would uh, go out and they would buy the .com and the .org and the .ca mm -hmm. and all the potential variations of their uh, primary name associated right. with that. The other thing I think they think about is the ability to kind of create a um, a branded safe zone online. So, you know, we're all familiar with things like phishing attacks. Yes. And uh, you have to really scrutinize the URL that you're going to and, you know, mm -hmm. does it seem suspicious? Well, if you're going to, uh, let's say you bank with .acme uh, yes. uh, banking and you go to .acme, you can pretty be assured that everything at .acme uh, reflects the content or the transactions associated with that. So it's a little bit of a safer brand sure. zone. So then, this, this reduction of risk uh, that you're not being fished is going to just help uh, speed up, smooth out the, the buying journey. That's kind of a, you know, a, a basic technical approach to why they would do that. But mm -hmm. I suspect there's a more transformative opportunity right. as... Um, uh, let me give you an example that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, if I were to take the domain dot bananas, and I was to put uh, strawberry in front of that, you had immediately have an reaction to strawberry dot bananas. You think of something, are you thinking of anything strawberry banana? Uh, that's a, yeah, um, something that tastes good. Tastes good, delicious, yeah. maybe a yeah. smoothie. I was just right. in Mexico, I, yeah. was, I was thinking daiquiri. <laughs> now if I say um, vomit dot banana, Ooh. what a different reaction that Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, now that's an extreme example, but I think the context in which organizations place those words with their brands, because you still have to have the prefix to the dot brand. 
is potentially transformational in right. how they do that. It creates a set of meanings for people as they come to your site and mm -hmm. experience your brand online. So I think if you do that really well, if you use customer insight to really understand what's meaningful to your customers, uh, that has the potential to really speed up the adoption. As people mm -hmm. say, that's a very satisfying experience to mm -hmm. me. Um, you know, and that's powerful for brands. Yeah, and so how is this going to transform the search aspect? I would imagine it have a, have a pretty big impact if, if I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, hey, Norm's just back from Mexico and I bet you he had a lot of those strawberry daiquiris. How is that going to, is that going to make, make you hire on a search engine if you can connect your brand right to what maybe the want or desire you of know the that's a fantastic a really a fantastic question it's really early days but i think that is part of the question that has to be answered as we kind of go through that I, it's a convention but i don't think it's conventional yet okay and you know google for example is one of the companies that has bought a lot of those branded top level domains so you know i think they're anticipating the future of this as a convention mm -hmm. uh, you know, technically, a search engine will index uh, a top-level domain just like it would index any other top-level right. domain. But, you know, if you're .Nike, the content that's at .Nike is likely to be very authoritative about, you know, about mm -hmm. Nike. Yeah. So I could foresee, I don't know if this is the case, but I could see, uh, you know, search engines looking at that and uh, recognizing that is the authoritative content for that. So there might be an advantage to it. Right. So who wouldn't uh, want this top-level domain? There are a lot of top-level domains. For example, .shoes, .bike. Um, so if you were, um, if you wanted to be associated with .bike, if you were uh, Nishiki Bikes and you wanted mm -hmm. to be Nishiki .bike, that make much uh, make a lot of sense. Um, it's also quite expensive. Okay. Uh, the application process that was done in uh, 2012 was $185,000 for the application. And then you have to maintain the domain. You you become the domain authority for your branded top-level domain. Right. That's not usually in most organizations' core capabilities. So they would work with a, uh, an ICANN partner to, uh, to sort of maintain that, make sure that's secure. And so there's probably a fee structure associated with that as well. So it's probably for the bigger brands. Yeah, bigger brands and a brand that wants to invest in its future. So what else is happening that, that you've seen emerge? I mean, what is, how is mobility, uh, mobile, um, transforming uh, how people are using the web? It's almost like there's um, a parallel web for mobile. Um, you know, I was just reflecting about, uh, you know, the experience I had with Uber. Okay, and I was really trying to figure out why I'm so com find it so compelling because it, ostensibly you get a car, you go from point A to point B, and you pay for your journey. So, uh -huh. you know, why was the why was that experience so compelling? Part of it is the context. I'm in a mobile context. Um, I have a lot of data coming to me that's specific to my journey. I can see my driver. Um, the personal connection I'm having with that experience then through that mobile device is very, very compelling. Mm -hmm. So I think there are opportunities in the mobile space to transform the way business is done that perhaps are exclusively mobile. I would not have the same experience that I would have if that was a desktop right. experience. And is it is it a control thing, Norm? Do you think people <laughs> just get a little bit of a lift I'm in charge as opposed to the taxi that just went by and they did they ignored me or you know I was fascinated when FedEx launched package tracking mm -hmm. uh, because I mean 99.9 .9 something percent of the time your package is gonna get there why the heck would you want to track it yet package tracking itself transformed the entire shipping slash logistics industry yeah. um, the craze around Fitbits and personal data so I think there's a very deep uh, resonance with being able to connect with um, feeling engaged in mm -hmm. a transaction or in a process at that level. So you're right. getting that real-time feedback. Right. And I think that's probably what's very compelling about it. So going all the way back to tracking your package online, uh, Fitbit, um, and again, a Fitbit, a, an almost exclusively mobile experience. Yeah. Um, so I think that's part of it. It's a sense of control or a sense of um, being connected to that. Now, I know, I know you've worked with clients in the hospitality sector. Yes. And, and what are we seeing in uh, uh, the, the consumer 
and their relationship to hospitality brands and being mobile. What, what have you picked up on? I have to say, I've, uh, well, I thought the hospitality industry got off to a bit of a slow start. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had Airbnb kind of shake up that industry, yeah, right? right? Very, very big shake up. Uh, what I'm seeing is the hospitality industry, particularly hotels, um, really up their game in the mobile space. Um, now you can uh, book your room through your mobile device, you can check in prior yes, to it, yeah. you can unlock your room with the mobile device. Uh, you really have a lot more control over that experience entirely. So I think they've really responded positively to okay. that. I think uh, one great thing about technology is it, um, you know, it facilitates a sort of more mundane transaction right. and it allows people who had to do that before do what people do better. Uh, those personal connections, those relationships. I think we've been far too tasked with, you know, the mundane transactions. Um, and if we can, you know, find an appropriate place for technology to take that off our shoulders and really elevate what people do best, mm -hmm. I think that's, the, that's that, the sweet spot. Well, that's cool. Now, what do we know, Norm, about these, the, these new alternatives in currency, uh, Bitcoin? I mean, there, there's some interesting things happening. Uh, in terms of paying for things from a mobile perspective. Have you had any experience or insight on that? Yeah, I love the concept of mobile payment. Uh, I always forget my wallet. I never forget my mobile device. Right. Um, and I mean, very early, I was one of the first adopters of BlackBerry Pay, trying it at Tim Hortons. And mm -hmm. it was a bit of an uneven experience, not because of BlackBerry, but just that the mm -hmm. technology wasn't there. Yep. And I'm frankly, I'm very surprised that it really hasn't caught on uh, more mm -hmm. than it has. But, um, you know, I have to say that uh, card companies have also come along being able to tap your cards. So yes. the difference in the experience between paying with a mobile. Yeah. I think the opportunity is if you can um, bring things like loyalty into the transaction. I think Starbucks does a fantastic job with their mobile payment. Mm -hmm. um, it's a simple barcode scan. I mean, it's connected to a traditional credit card. Right. But they've integrated the loyalty to the transaction all within the app experience. And I think that's a powerful factor. So I see more of that happening. Okay. So why do you think it's been, what's been slowing down the mobile pay uh, world? I think the same thing that has the potential to slow down the Internet of Things has been what slowed down uh, that adoption. It's that there are a lot of players with their own interests and not enough, um, trying to think of the right uh, word, uh, not autonomy, but mm -hmm. um, neutrality uh, between the yeah. players. Right. So your neutrality would afford kind of a common platform with anonymity and security so that each organization wasn't giving away trade secrets and would facilitate that commerce across a number of groups that had special interest in that. Right. Uh, I think the Internet of Things, which is you know, the, mm -hmm. perhaps the next big thing, right. um, will suffer from the same thing unless they can come up with a neutrality platform that works so right. that you know, your data traveling across that network is protected from someone else who may have a different interest. I mean, I have a Nest thermostat, yes, um, but I have other devices that are not Nest. So do I want necessarily Google to know what all those devices are doing in my home? I don't know. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think that's gotta be the kind of like a, a common standard. That is, okay, this is for you, the consumer. We as providers of the things, we don't need to you know, get so involved right. that, yeah. So where is this Internet of Things gonna go? Because you and I know that there's been an Internet of Things for a long time. <laughs> yeah. It just hasn't been labeled. It's a great question. I mean, <laughs> I'd have to be a pretty sharp prognosticator. To, uh, let me grab my crystal ball. Okay. Take a wild guess. Um, I look at what GE's transformation has been Thank over you. the last couple of years. Yep. And, um, I mean, an industrial company um, with, you know, practices. I mean, they had sensors on things because they needed to know how long the mean time to failure mm -hmm. of a jet engine blade was. Right. Yeah. Because they price out their, um, their industrial products based on usage time. So they needed that data to be able to create accurate pricing models. Um, but that analytic capability has afforded them a, a, an ability to transform the way they can be perceived as an organization mm -hmm. uh, to be a digital organization. 
Uh, and I think that's probably the most um, interesting thing is that, you know, uh, we've, like you mentioned, these have been around for a long time, but we're now recognizing that that digital transformation is part of the brand. Part, part of the brand, and, and the important part, I guess, to the customer is it makes GE more cost effective, and that lowers price or increases value. Yeah. And when GE is dealing in so many global transactions, they have to bring something to the table, yes. which says, hey, we can do this better, faster, and cheaper. What about this? What about all these RFID codes? Uh, did I get that acronym, acronym mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, where, where people can now track and, and get the transparency on where food is coming from, how long it's been there, or you know, where's my shipment of uh, sweaters? Where's, I mean, this, isn't this kind of changing the whole, um, distribution uh, system and, and? You know, I was thinking about an example of, uh, you know, just something simple like uh, credit verification when you're using your credit card. Mm -hmm. um, there's a terminal, which is part of the transaction, and then there's you as a person and your card. And those three things combine together to uh, provide an experience to you, which is seamless. That transaction is approved in milliseconds. Yes. And what they've done is they've taken you as an identified individual, your card, which is the connectivity to that, and the ID of that piece of hardware, that terminal, and said, do these things all make sense together? Mm -hmm. uh, if you were performing that transaction in Italy, but nine minutes before you'd done that transaction somewhere else, they know those locations from where those terminals are. So they're able to improve your customer experience by not having you to call and you know, reauthorize. Right. And, they know. So I think you're going to be able to create customer experiences that are far more seamless. Uh, and I think that's really transformative. Yeah. Let's talk about this for a second, Norm. Let's say I'm walking into a store and the retailer starts to read who I am. And somewhere in the background, someone starts to, uh, someone, something, starts to say, well, this is his buying history. Yeah. As a matter of fact, this is a return visit to the store, and the last time he was here, he bought a pair of blue pants and a pink shirt. Yeah, but so he's back to replace the shirt. But there's all sorts of things that are now um, being read. It's fascinating. Yeah, by technology, and um, that too can be helpful for the customer experience. Absolutely. Is it going too far? That's a personal decision. For me, it's not. If you're creating a better customer experience and you're securing that data about my behavior, <clears throat> I'm pretty okay with that. Now, lots of people are going to have a range of opinions right. on that. Uh, interestingly, that happens a lot now. Just as you walk past any Wi-Fi hotspot with your device, if you've ever associated your device with that, uh, let's use, go back to Starbucks, for right. example. They want you to log into their internet so they know the address of your device. They then want you to use your app so they can associate your device with you. Anytime you walk back, walk past a wireless access point that's connected to the network that Starbucks uses, they know where you've been. Right. So you don't have to give them your location, they're yeah. getting a lot of that. So there's an incredible amount of data that's out there about us that you know is passive and we don't even realize it. Yeah, and I think that that may be, you know, your, your use of the word passive uh, sort of connects me to the concept of neutrality. Yes. It, just because they have it, that doesn't mean they have to use it. So your role is really then helping, helping clients use the technology uh, in such a way that it's for good and not evil. I'd like to think so. You're kind of a superhero in the whole technology Go landscape. On. Come on, it's true, Norm, I know. I've seen you in that suit. That, that we weren't going to talk about that. Oh, yeah, right, I'm sorry. Anyway, Norm, thanks for joining us today. It was my pleasure. We are going to keep, we're going to make you a monthly feature on the, uh, you know, keeping us ahead of the Techstar um, curve. I would enjoy that a lot. Well, there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Norm. Cheers. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and please see the subscription button right here or there or somewhere here around here and push that because you can be a subscriber to AQ's Blog and Grill and we'll send you really cool, informative stuff. So, thanks for watching.
KQ's Blog and Grill.